Now, I think you'll agree with me that it would be quite the challenge for a town with a name like Asbestos to reinvent itself. It's not the most ideal place for a destination wedding, and I don't think many non-locals would host their children's birthday parties there, even if there is the promise of a pony ride, which I don't think there is. This is a major problem the people of asbestos faced and continue to face as the global asbestos industry collapses around them. If they can't keep doing what generations of their families have been doing since the 19th century, what's next? States, the Environmental Protection Agency allied itself with American mothers in a campaign that depicted asbestos, even Canadian asbestos, as something that put children in danger. And at the start of the 1980s, a new lawsuit was being launched against Johns Manville almost every day because of what asbestos does to the human body, and the company was really feeling the financial strain. No lawsuits were launched in Quebec, however, as Johns Manville and companies like it had made friends with government officials in the 1950s so that asbestos-related diseases were taken off the compensatable industrial disease list. Lawsuits simply weren't possible. that Canada again provided for the industry, Johns Manville was forced to file for bankruptcy and left the town of Asbestos in 1983. Okay, now it's time to panic. What is a town called Asbestos, home of the largest chrysotile asbestos mine in the world, supposed to do when the industry collapses? Despite government-funded programs designed to bring new industry to the region, there was very little that could be done with the people and the land. Well, very little except for finding new markets for the fireproof mineral. Western world had closed its doors to asbestos products and imports, Canada included hypocritically enough, there remained untapped markets for the mineral. Former Canadian Johns Manville officials purchased the Jeffrey Mine at a discount and quickly worked with government representatives to make trade alliances with countries like China, India, Mexico, Iran, and Zimbabwe, where for some reason asbestos wasn't such a dirty word. campaigns were launched with ideas like safe use and asbestos saves more people than it kills, but these were not effective anywhere except for the developing world. Turner and Newell, which once boasted about how it so completely furnished countries like Zimbabwe with asbestos products that it was hard for anyone there to go through their day without coming into contact with the mineral, filed for bankruptcy in 1998 because of all the workers' compensation claims being filed against it in Britain. Rochdale, England now stands empty, with warning signs posted all around it and environmental groups investigating it as a wasteland after evidence of illegal asbestos dumping was discovered in the river and along the public footpath that runs beside it. A plaque has been placed just across from Rochdale City Hall, near the War Memorial, commemorating all of those who had died of asbestos-related disease, and reading, asbestos, once a magic mineral, but always a killer dust. throughout the history of the industry, Britain continues to play an active role in the global asbestos trade. Each year on July 1st, also known as Canada Day, the British Lung Foundation hosts an Action Mesothelioma Day to promote awareness of the threat asbestos poses to human health. 
to provide support for families of those who have suffered with this fatal disease, and to criticize Canada for its continued role in the industry. spent smearing the African asbestos industry and promoting Canadian asbestos as safe and friendly has truly backfired on the country. While Quebec was once the top supplier of asbestos in the world, it's now in fifth place behind Russia, China, Brazil and Kazakhstan. But rather than protest on the 12th of June for Russia Day or in Rio de Janeiro during Carnival, it's Canada Day and Canada that specifically targeted and criticized all over the world. Is it possible that Canada's become a victim to the very double standard that it helped create? All of this, of course, comes back to the town of asbestos. The land, the mine, the people, the place. In 2006, the mayor of Asbestos attempted to have the name of the community changed in order to attract new industry, but instead of voting for the change, the people of Asbestos voted for a new mayor instead. According to one resident, changing the name would tell the world that the community was ashamed of its product, and it would just be one more nail in their coffin. more and more people leave the community to find work elsewhere, houses go up for sale and schools get boarded up, the town of asbestos continues to advertise itself as a viable place for business opportunities while promoting the mineral in the developing world. Once a community made up of war heroes and once celebrated for bringing safety to the western world, asbestos is now the butt of jokes on late night talk shows and those who work in the mine, as their fathers and grandfathers had done before them, are referred to as murderers on blog posts about Canada's continued involvement in the industry. All of these critics forget, however, that life's much more complicated than that, and nobody in the entire world knows more about the triumphs and the tragedies of the global asbestos industry than these people, raised on the front lines of the largest chrysotile asbestos mine in the world, in a town called Asbestos. Um.